Our Father in heaven, thank you for your grace and uh, thank you for your love. Thank you for thy holy Sabbath and Lord, we pray that uh, it may be a blessing and we may take it as a treasure in our hearts. That Lord, we may hide it in our hearts that we may not sin against thee. And so bless your children as we look into your word that uh, the things you have meant us to receive today, we shall receive them with gladness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, it's uh, another time that uh, I really want to thank the Lord for his mercies and uh, being able to give us an opportunity to be able to study his word and uh, to share in the blessings of the Sabbath. And so I'm praying that uh, the Lord will speak to us and uh, his blessings shall rest upon us. I thought that uh, we could uh, remind ourselves of the things that uh, we re already know and they may make an impression to our hearts once again as we study them. And so uh, I'm going to look at uh, the book of uh, Matthew chapter 25. Uh, uh, I'll be looking at the book of Matthew chapter 25. Um, first of all, the, the book of Matthew chapter 25 is uh, an interesting chapter to look at. Every now that we look at it, it brings uh, fresh information that uh, touches the time that you are living in. And so uh, we are told that uh, we may live a life that uh, will hasten the coming of Jesus Christ. But uh, before I dwell, I, I delve in this uh, chapter so much, I just took, like to bring something on the screen. That is First Chronicle chapter 12, verses uh, 32. In the book of First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, we are told in the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200 and all their brethren were at their command men and so it is only a people who understand the times they are living in and what they ought to do that uh, will be at the command of israel to show them and instruct them in the way of the lord so that uh, a people may be prepared for the second coming of jesus christ now concerning uh the book of matthews chapter 25 in verse 1, we are told, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Uh, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. This is the most important aspect of this message. That um, at midnight there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now, we understand that uh, the book of uh, Matthew chapter 25 applies to uh the time of the end when uh, a message shall go forth behold the bridegroom coming but uh, i want us to revisit this message once again that this is the very message that was given by miller and their associates 
the Advent movement back in 1840s. And so going back to that history will help us to understand even the timing of this message in our time. Um, William Miller, uh, he was raised and in 1820s, he studied his Bible and came to conclusions that uh, uh, there will be a second coming of Jesus Christ at the expiry of the 2300 days. Uh, and that is uh, in uh, 1843, not even 1844. He came to 1843 when uh, the 2300 days will expire and then Jesus Christ comes. But it was uh, um, a misconception that uh, the sanctuary represented the earth as we know it, but uh, the sanctuary did not represent the earth. The reason why they didn't understand this is because they had been just coming from the dark ages and uh, the little horn had trampled upon the sanctuary and hidden the truth about the sanctuary um, in the basket of traditions. And so the people thought that the sanctuary was the earth, but it was not the earth. And that's how they um, really didn't get the message correct. But let us look at uh, what Miller and his associates were doing at that time. We are told that um, they were sounding the midnight cry. Now, the midnight cry was really sounded as the feast of the trumpet from 1833 to 1843 and it was also what we may call the first angel's message this is so much important uh knowing this history that uh, the midnight cry was the feast of the trumpet and also the first angel's message and so that is why we are told that uh, the loud cry is a swelling of uh, the first, the second, and the third angel's message and comes as the fourth angel's message. And so uh, if we are going to be able to sound the midnight cry again, we have to understand very well the first angel's message because the midnight cry was the feast of the trumpets and the uh, first angel's message. And so looking at the first angel's message in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14. Now, uh, it is always that uh, the people start the three angels' messages from uh, Revelation chapter 14, verses, um, verses 6. But uh, that is not the case. The three angels' messages really starts at Revelation chapter 14, verses 1. It starts from Revelation chapter 14, verses 1. Uh, and uh, it is because of uh, this misunderstanding of where the three angels' messages begin that uh, really we find not uh, 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 much knowledge of what uh, is needed of us to uh, really understand. And so uh, that message starting from uh, Revelation 14.1 says, says like this. And uh, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an 144,000, having his father's name written in their forehead. And so this is how the, the three angels' messages begin uh, in Revelation chapter 14. This is how the three angels' messages begin in Revelation chapter uh, 14. And uh, before we sound the three angels' messages, then uh, we have to receive the seal of God. We have to have the Father's name in our forehead. We must have uh, the Father's name in our forehead, which uh, is his character, which is his character. The same uh, uh, message 
of having the seal or the name of the father in our forehead is found in uh, revelation uh chapter three revelation chapter three and this is uh uh verse uh, verse 12 him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I'll write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I'll write upon him my new name. And so we see that uh, those in Revelation chapter 14 who are sounding the first angel's message or the three angels' message have the father's name in their forehead. Now, when you go back to Revelation chapter three, those who are having the father's name in their forehead, they are not Laodicean uh, uh, people. They are not in the condition of Laodicea, but they are in Philadelphian condition. And so the silent point is that um, for us to be able to sound the midnight cry, and which is the first angel's message, we must have the father's name in our forehead we must have the father's name in our forehead and uh, we must go back to the state of uh, philadelphia and uh, come out of the state of uh, laodicea that uh, many people find themselves in because we are going to look at uh, the midnight cry and see what it all means to us and so in the midnight cry it's a repetition of the Feast of the Trumpets, uh, it was a, a Feast of the Trumpets back in the days of William Miller, and uh, it was also the first angel's message. And we find that the first angel's message will be repeated once again. But then for us to sound the midnight cry, for us to sound the first angel's message again, we have to be in a Philadelphian uh, 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 state and not Laodicean state. And so we must come out of this Laodicean state for if we are going to sound the three angels messages now uh talking about uh, the wise and the foolish virgins which are connected to the midnight crime and connecting it with the first angels message as it were in that time uh in this uh sounding of the first angels message uh let us just go back to it the first angels message and see uh whatever it is uh, because we are talking about sounding again the first angel's message. Now, the three angels' messages starts in Revelation 14.1, that is receiving the seal of God, having the approval of God, because the three angels' messages are about preparing the people to stand in the presence of a holy God without sin. And so we cannot prepare a people while we are still in the condition of falling and rising and falling and rising. We must come to a position that uh, we overcome all known sin and that the Lord give us the strength so that as we sound these messages, uh, they go out with the power that they should go with. Why? Because we find the three angels' messages are also the everlasting gospel. And uh, we are told in Romans, Romans um, chapter 1, verse um, uh, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And so if you are going to sound the everlasting gospel, the three angels' messages, then we must not be ashamed of the gospel. Being ashamed of the gospel, what does it mean? It means that not being able to have that victory or the power of God that accompanies it. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and God is not saving a people in sin. He is saving people from sin. He is going to take a church which is pure, a church which is holy, a church which does not have any spot in it. This everlasting gospel also, which is the midnight cry, the first angel's message, and so on, we are told that uh, this everlasting gospel in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 24, um, 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, this witness here is uh, 
an active element of the gospel. It is not the theoretical part of the message because the theoretical part of the message has gone to the four corners of the world. But it is it is a practical aspect of it that uh, will arouse the nations. When this glory comes upon the people, then they shall be able to do the works of Jesus Christ. In the sounding of the first angel's message, which is the midnight cry, also the repetition of it, I want you to notice what happened under the sounding of this message. I'm just putting something together and laying some ground for the future studies of this. Revelation chapter 14 and uh, verses um, 7. This everlasting gospel, which is uh, the same as the gospel in the book of Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, and Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, this message says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Now, continue highlighting these things that uh, I'm bringing forth to you because they'll be able to help us to understand the midnight cry better. So what are we saying? If we have to recap what we are saying, that uh, the midnight cry was sounded by William Miller, it coincided with the Feast of the Trumpet, it also coincided with the first angel's message. The same midnight cry is the everlasting gospel of the first angel's message, which is fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment is come. Now, one thing you have to ask yourself, if the midnight cry in the times of William Miller uh, was the first angel's message, which was the judgment hour, what will it present in our days? Because it has to be repeated, which means the judgment message has to be repeated. But now, when Miller was preaching about the judgment hour and the first angel's message, it was Christ going into the most holy place to begin the work. But now, when this message returns, it is not again, as it is placed in the book of Matthew chapter 25, when it is repeated once again, it is not about Christ going into the most holy place to begin the work, but he is going to finish up the work. We understand that uh, when Miriam Miller sounded the message, uh, the first angel's message, it was Christ entering into the most holy place to begin the work. But when the midnight cry is repeated in the end time, Christ is not entering into the most holy place. He is coming out of the most holy place to end the work. Now, if in the sounding of uh, the midnight cry, the judgment began, and we know that the judgment began with um, Abel, the righteous dead. It was the judgment of the dead. Then we understand that if the judgment hour is to be repeated again. It's not the repetition of the judgment of the dead, but the judgment of the living. Now, how I understand that uh, it is the judgment of the living. When the judgment of the dead began, the church was in uh, Philadelphia instead. And it was a midnight cry. We can prove that, that it was a midnight cry. And you can read that in COL 4.2, COL 4.6, and COL 4.12 we'll find that um, uh, it was then uh, in the beginning of the judgment of the dead. And uh, when this message comes back again, we are not talking about the judgment of the dead. If we understand that the first angel ha message has to be repeated, it has to be repeated that Christ is not going into the most holy place, but he is coming out of the most holy place. Another issue that you have to understand about the midnight cry. Then in 1840s, uh, as I said, it was under the Philadelphian church. And uh, in the end time, when the midnight cry is sounded, it is under the Laodicean church, which is facing the end time events. And uh, uh, how do we know that uh, Actually, this midnight cry is when Christ is coming out of the most holy place and it is in the end time. Uh, the book, uh, A Call to Stand Apart, the book, uh, A Call to Stand Apart, CSA, uh, I'd like just to bring out something. Maybe some people have seen it. Maybe you have not seen it. It's just putting some pieces together. 
uh, a call to stand apart, page 20, paragraph 9. Allow me to share this. Look at this. When this midnight cry will be sounded again, but uh, I want to connect it with something else. Uh, the roots of the plant strike down deep into the soil and hidden from the sight nourish the life of the plant. So with the Christian, it is by the invisible union of the soul with Christ through faith that the spiritual life is nourished. But the stony ground hearers depend upon self instead of Christ. They trust in their good works and impulses and are strong in their righteousness. They are not strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Such a one hath no truth in himself or he is not connected with Christ. Now, why do I bring the stony ground hearers in the parable of uh, the midnight cry and the foolish virgins? Because if you go to COL, you will find that uh, the stony ground hearers are um, the virgins too. Now, look at uh, COL. COL 411 paragraph one. I'll just highlight it and then read it. Look at this. The parable of the virgins and the foolish virgins more so, it is the same as the, the, the ground that is stony, the ground which soil was stony. And so we are finding that the stony ground are those that trust in their own righteousness. They are trusting in their works rather than the works of Christ. And that applies to Laodicean church because we are told that um, uh, it uh, brags that it is increased in goods and uh, it is rich and have need of nothing. The class represented by the foolish virgins, I want you to take care of this, to take note of this, I mean. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. This class are represented as also by the stony ground hearers. Now, the stony ground hearers are also represented by the foolish virgins. So we have the midnight cry, and then it is the first angel's message in repetition. It is not the judgment of the dead, but actually it represents a judgment, and soon, very soon, we shall see which judgment is that, which I can tell you uh, afore that uh, it is the judgment of the living. And then these same foolish virgins are the stony ground uh, uh, um, uh, hearers, and then we are told that um, they trust in their own ones and in their own merits. And this is the charge against the Laodicean church. In fact, if the foolish virgins are the stony grounds, then we have just to look uh, again, what is the condition of the foolish virgins? What is the condition of the foolish virgins? And uh, I'll bring you to something which is more interesting. Uh, foolish virgins, they are also Laodicean. And uh, you can read that in um, Review and Herald. You can find that in Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, paragraph 10, and I'll share with you. And so we are putting the pieces together so we may understand what is this midnight cry, how are we to sound it, and uh, how is it going to sound. Now, the state of the church represented by the foolish virgin is also spoken of as the Laodicean state. So you have the midnight cry, which is the first angel's message, which is also the foolish virgins, which is also the Laodicean state. All combined together, and we know that Laodicean state is not the state in 1840s, it is the state after 1840s, which means that this is the church living in the end time, which is in the uh, state of the foolish virgin. Laodicean state is the foolish virgin state. And so we are looking at the end of the world and not at the beginning of the world. And so we are not also looking at the beginning of the judgment, but the, at the end of the judgment. 
And then if the midnight cry of the first session pronounced the judgment of the dead, then we can be of sure that uh, when it comes again, it is pronouncing the judgment of the, uh, of the uh, living. But uh, let us try to proceed from here. Uh, in COL, we are told about um, the bridegroom. Look at the timing of repeating the first angel's message and the midnight cry. Uh, and uh, there are some questions we have to ask ourselves as we read this. COL 412, paragraph 1. It is in a crisis that character is revealed. When the honest voice proclaimed at midnight, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, and the sleeping virgins were aroused from their slumbers, it was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency. This is not 1844, this is something way uh, in the end times. Look at what she says. Both parties were taken out unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency, and the other was found without preparation. Now look at this statement. So now, a sudden and unlooked for calamity. Something that brings the soul face to face with death will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. And look at how she connects the midnight cry with a certain unlooked for calamity. And then she talks about are being brought face to face with death. And then she says this, the great final tests, I'll just go there. The great final test comes at the close of human probation when it will be too late for the soul's need to be supplied. Now, remember in 1840s, when the midnight cry was sounded and the first angel's message was sounded, um, and uh, it was the parable of the 10 virgins, uh, at that moment, we are not told that um, the virgins, the five foolish virgins went to buy uh, oil and when they came back, the door was closed. That, that is not the thing in 1840s. And so we have to understand that the way it is brought up in Matthew chapter 25, it is at the time that probation is about to close when the midnight Christ is sounded. But then let us go back to this quote as we look at Matthew 25, in Matthew 25, when the five foolish virgins went to buy the oil, when they came back, the door was closed, and that is the door of probation. So there's no going inside. Then the timing of this event is when a sudden and unlooked for calamity arises. Now, I understand that uh, many Adventists say that uh, they understand the issue to do with Sunday law, the test, and the mark so well. But that is not how the prophetess puts it in uh, 60, before we come back to this 60, page 17, we are told, the light we have received upon the third angel's message is the true light. The mark of the beast is exactly what it has been proclaimed to be. Not all in regard to this matter is yet understood, nor will it be understood until the unrolling of the scroll. So. Those people who brag that they understand the issues to do with the test, the mark uh, of the beast, really they are in self-deception because we are told that it will only be understood as the scroll is unrolled. And so the, we have a sudden unlooked for calamity. This sudden unlooked for calamity brings the soul face to face with death. Now we understand that it is only the Sunday decree that will bring the soul face to face with death because also it is the great final test before the human probation closes. And so we can understand that when the midnight cry starts going forth, it is not the judgment of the dead, but it is the judgment of the living because it is a time of when the probation is closing. Now you understand that we had the five wise and the five foolish. Now, in the sounding of the midnight cry in the end times, 
The Lord is having a people standing on Mount Zion, having the Father's name in their forehead. That is only when they can sound the midnight cry or the three angels' messages that swells into the fourth angel's message. That is the repetition of the first angel's message, the second angel's message, and the third angel's message. This is what will swell into the loud cry of the fourth angel's message. Um, and so the five foolish had not prepared. The five wise had the oil in their lamp. And this is the event that we are talking about. When they came back, come back, they cannot enter because in um, LDE 179.2, we are told the great issue so near at the hand, enforcement of Sunday laws will weed out those whom God had not appointed and he will have a pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for them later, later in. These are the ones standing on Mount Zion, having been prepared and having the seal of God, the Father's name, so that they may receive the latter rain to be able to sound the loud cry and bring the other sheep, which is not part of the fold, that they be one flock under one shepherd. Now, when the five foolish go out to bring the oil, when they come back, the door is closed because God has weeded them out and they are not part of the wise. They are not part of the procession. They are not part of those who are going to share in the latter rain. They are in Laodicean state, and uh, we are told um, the Laodicean state is a bad state, but why is the Laodicean state so bad? This state that uh, the foolish virgins are um, in. Uh, a, a Laodicean person, we are told something so interest, interesting. Uh, I'll try to find this that um, the Laodicean state, uh, he, he deceives both parties. Uh, he deceives both parties. That is uh, our higher calling, page 348. These things are so much interlocked together, the parable of the virgins, Laodicean state and the stony ground. And when we are studying it, we must bring all evidence together of the Laodicean state, the virgins and uh, the stony ground together. And that is why you saw that I, I talked about the stony ground. And also I talked about the Laodicean state. And um, we are talking about the foolish virgins because the, the state talked about the foolish virgins is the state of Laodicean uh, state. Why is uh, the five foolish virgins rejected? We are told that they are in Laodicean state. And why is the Laodicean state so bad? Half-hearted Christians are worse than infidels, for their deceptive words and non-committal position lead many astray. The infidel shows his colors. The lukewarm Christian deceives both parties. He is neither a good worldly nor a good Christian. Satan uses him to do a work that no one else can do. And that is why that uh, the five foolish virgins are lost because they cannot be part of uh, the wise virgin. And so in the sounding of um, uh, the midnight cry, when probation is just about to close, the Lord must have a people who are prepared, who are sanctified, and uh, who are like the children of Issachar, who have prepared for the time, and they understand it and what Israel ought to do, so that um, when they go forth, they may not be sounding the trumpet with uncertain notes. The Lord will only have a people sounding a midnight cry who are sounding the trumpet with a certain note so that the armies of the Lord may not be confused. And that is why the five wise are accepted to join the procession, but the five foolish are not accepted. Laodicean state is not accepted to join in the midnight cry, but we find that it must be in the Philadelphian start that we must be able to sound the loud cry because, uh, or uh, repeat the three angels' messages. Talking about uh, the timing also, continuing to talk about the timing of uh, the five, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the time of the uh, repetition of the midnight cry, when all the three angels' messages come together to make up Revelation chapter 18 of the loud cry. In early writing, this is um, what we read. Early writing 254, and then uh, I can be able to come back to the scriptures and uh, we, we see some of uh, 
some startling things there. I'll be writing page 254, paragraph one. This is uh, when uh, the three angels' messages are repeated and they swell into a loud cry. I want you to see what kind of judgment is going on at this point, because I told you that the repetition of the midnight cry is not the judgment of the dead, because that happened in 1840s when first the midnight cry was given. But when it is repeated, it is in the judgment of the living. But let us see also who is included in this judgment of the midnight crime. As the ministration of Jesus closed in the holy place and he passed into the holiest and stood before the ark containing the law of God, he sent another mighty angel with a third message to the world. A parchment was placed in the angel's hand and he ascended to the earth in power and majesty. He proclaimed a fearful warning with the most terrible threatening ever born to man. This message was designed to put the children of God upon their guard by showing them the hour of temptation and anguish that was before them. Said the angel, they will be brought into close compact with the beast and his image. Their only hope of eternal life is to remain steadfast. Although their lives are at stake, they must hold fast to the truth. The third angel's message closes his message thus, here is the patient of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. As he repeated these words, he pointed to the heavenly sanctuary. So the messages are repeated. And then they are pointed to the heavenly sanctuary. This is not, again, the pointing of 1840s, but it is the pointing at the end of the time. Now the messages are being repeated. The people are being brought close with the compact uh, with compact with the image of the beast. Now, mark this. This is not the mark of the beast. This is the image of the beast. And we understand the image of the beast is the agitation of uh, the church and the state uh, uh, unity. It is not the mark of the beast. It is when the apostate Protestantism unites with the, uh, 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 with the, uh, with the state so as to enact the mark of the beast. And so we are looking uh, at the repetition of this message uh, when there is the compact with the beast and his image. And uh, you can be sure that in the time that we are living in, there is a lot of agitation of the false Protestantism uniting with the, the, the state to be able to bring in the mark of the, uh, the, uh, the beast. And so right now, as we are speaking right now, as I'm speaking right now, uh, we are in that period when we are seeing the compact between the beast and his image. The agitation are going on, but the Seventh Day Adventists are waiting for the mark of the beast. When it is too late, when it is the time that the foolish virgins will come in and the door is closed, when the Laodicean will try to come back to the Philadelphian state and it will not be possible. If you are not passing from Laodicean to the wise, if you are not passing from the foolish to the wise, then uh, my brethren, uh, we are sleeping and we are waiting for the wrong event. We are waiting for the mark of the beast when we are being told that it is the, in the image of the beast that we are to look again to the heavenly sanctuary. And so it says that um, as he repeated these words, he pointed to the heavenly sanctuary. Then look at this. The minds of all who embrace this message are directed to the most holy place where Jesus stands before the earth. Now, it is interesting that Jesus, the position that Christ is standing at. All this time, Christ has been sitting with his father and they have been doing judgment. But at this point, he is standing. He is not seated once again because Christ has been sitting. The books, the, the books were up, the thrones were set. Daniel chapter 7, and the ancient of, day, of the days did come and sit, and the son of man was brought before him, and the books were opened, and the judgment was set. They sat, and they started judgment. But at the repetition of these messages, what does Jesus Christ do? Jesus Christ stands before the earth. Now, hold on, on to that. Just don't leave there if you are there, but open your Bibles in the book of James, where is Jesus Christ standing and what is he doing? James chapter five, uh, 
and uh, that is verse 9. But I'll start as early as verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. This is the time of the coming of the Lord you are talking about. When Christ is standing before the ark, he's not seated. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth and had long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. So it is again the time of receiving the latter rain when God is weeding out those whom he have not ordained, when the wise, one, wise ones are being awakened. And also, one more thing is that um, uh, uh, the door is closing for those who will not receive the truth. And so it is a time for receiving the early and the latter rain. So we are told, be also, be also patient, establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord groweth nigh. So we can be sure it is the, at the end of the judgment and not the beginning of judgment, because the coming of the Lord groweth nigh. Verse 9 says, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge doeth what? The judge standeth before the door. Now, he is not standing at the door to go into the most holy place. That was in 1840s. He is standing at the door before the ark to come out. Now, if he is standing before the door to come out, I want us to finish this quote and then we go to the Bible. We shall finish. Uh, I started the other way around, e.g. white, then the Bible, but it should be the other way around. But uh, uh, I hope that you understand the presentation. The minds of all who embrace this message are directed to the most holy place where Jesus stands before the ark, making his final intercession for all. Now, this intercession, the final intercession, when the midnight cry, or when these three angels' messages are repeated and they swell into the loud cry, what is the judgment that is going on at this point? Whose intercession is going on? Look at this. Making his final intercession for all those for whom mass is still lingers and for those who have ignorantly broken the law of god now as a seventh day adventist you cannot count yourself as a person who has been ignorantly breaking the law of god that is not the case <clears throat> because the law of god has been revealed to this church since the 1848 and when you come to 1863 all the laws including the health laws they were given to the church. And so if we have been breaking the law of God, it has not been ignorant, but it has been breaking with knowledge. So this final intercession, it is for those whom <clears throat> mass is still lingers. And for those who have ignorantly broken the law of God, that is number two. This atonement is made for the righteous dead as well as the righteous living. It is the judgment of the living at this point. Now, who are these righteous dead? It includes all who died trusting in Christ, but who not having received the light upon God's commandment. So this righteous death that you are really reading here, it is for those who had died not knowing God's commandment. So it cannot apply to the atonement of the seventh day Adventist. This is how I understand things. This is basic understanding of things. And had seen ignorantly in transgressing his precepts. When Christ is standing at the ark, when he is standing at the door to come out, he is not doing intercession for those who have been in truth. In fact, when uh, you read 90, uh, is it 1997 or 79? 97.2. This intercession, this final atonement, it is not for the people who have known the truth, but those who have died, not knowing the law of God, and those who are still living and have been breaking the law of God ignorantly, which means it's not for the children of God, because you read in LDE 179.2 that God has weeded them out, those whom we have not ordained, and he has a pure, true and sanctified ministry ready for the latter rain. And those are the sons of Issachar who understand the time they are those who are standing on Mount Zion with Jesus Christ having the name of their father in the forehead. They are those who have come out of Laodicea and have gone back to Philadelphia and start. They are having brotherly love in themselves. And uh, they can be able to sound the message. So this atonement, this final intercession, we are told, 
or that the people might know the time of their visitation. So there are people who will not understand their time of visitation. There are many who have not yet heard the testing truth for this time. And what is that testing truth? We are told that when the people are brought in compact with the image of the beast, not the mark of the beast. In fact, the image of the beast is the test for Seventh day Adventists if they understand the times. And if they understand the time, they receive the seal of God so that they may be able to proclaim the mark of the beast, which does not apply to us, but it applies to the people who have never known the mark of the beast as being Sunday sacredness. Those are people who are Muslims, those are people who are Sunday keepers and other denominations. But Seventh day Adventists understand the mark of the beast to be Sunday sacredness, and they don't have to be proclaimed that to be sealed. So the proclamation of the mark of the beast is for the people who are outside, but the test of Seventh day Adventist is the image of the beast. If they pass it, then they can be able to proclaim the mark of the beast. And so there are many who have not yet had the testing truth for this time. There are many whom the spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgment is the time of, for mercy, uh, of mercy for those who have no opportunity to learn what is truth. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them his heart of mercy is touched. Now, his hand is still stretched out to save while the door is closed to those who will not enter. So a door is closed for others and it is open for others. And you remember that um, the door closed for the foolish virgins. Those who had been in church, they had been proclaiming that uh, they know the three angels' messages, but uh, they... Um, they have not been sanctified with it. And so when the test is brought, they join the popular side because they have been interacting with the world so much that they have come to view matters as even the worldlings view it. And so when the test comes, they join the popular side. And when Seventh day Adventists are brought before the law, uh, they are, these apostates are the ones that uh, uh, bring insinuations against uh, their former brethren. And so brothers and sisters, we are living in a time when the judgment is to pass from the dead to the living. Now, I want us to read a few things in the Bible to show us what really the Lord is requiring of us in these times that we are living in. For us who have been Seventh day Adventists for so long and are um, looking forward in sharing in the proclamation of the fourth angel's message and sharing in the latter end. We are told that Christ is standing at the door of the most holy place to come out, not to go in. When he comes out, what is he going to do when he comes out of the most holy place? The book of uh, Leviticus chapter 16 is the best place to go because there is where the day of atonement is represented so clearly. And uh, I'll be looking at Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 16, and uh, what verse am I looking at? Uh, verses um, 15 onward. Verses 15 onward, as we come to, as we bring this to a close. Very interesting. As the Lord is standing at, um, at the ark, he's no longer seated. He is standing there, and the book of James told us he is standing there. He's about to come out because he's standing at the door. When he comes out of the most holy place, what is he doing? Look at this. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering. This is on the day of atonement that is for the people, Leviticus 16, 15, and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. This is in the most holy place. After this, verse 16 says, when he has done the work in the most holy place, verse 16 says, and he shall make an atonement all for the holy place. Now, we read in 97.2 uh, that this atonement is for those uh, 
whom mercy still lingers, those who have not understood the truth of the time which are contained in the most holy place. We saw that in early writing, page 254, paragraph 1, that it is for those who have been sinning against the law of God ignorantly and those who died without knowing the commandments of God. But look keenly, be a Bible student and look keenly at verse 16. After making an atonement in the most holy place before the mercy seat, and he shall make an atonement of the holy place. Remember, this is in the day of atonement. And we understand the atonement is in the most holy place. But the atonement in the most holy place, when you read the book, Great Controversy, it is only for those who have appeared before the Lord. <clears throat> and that is the seventh day Adventist. The Sunday keepers do not appear before the Lord in the most holy place. The Muslim do not appear before the Lord in the most holy place. But these people are either lodged in the holy place or in the courtyard. So when Christ comes out of the most holy place, the next place he makes an atonement for in the day of atonement is the holy place. Now remember, he is coming out never to go inside once again, because when he comes out, he will take off his clothes. And he shall make an atonement of, for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation. This is in the courtyard that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And look here, and there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And, verse 18, he shall go out at the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it, and shall take off the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat, and put it upon the horns of the altar round about, and he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with a finger seven times, and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place, and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live God. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live God and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgression in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the God and shall send him away by the hand of the pit man in the wilderness. And then Aaron shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar. And he that let go the God for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water and afterward come into the camp. And then uh, Aaron has changed his cloth and then he shall clothe on with another clothing and then he shall come back as uh, to bless the people. And that is when Christ comes back. And so we see the atonement for the mercy seat, then the atonement for the holy place, and then the atonement for the congregation. These atonements are for different people. The atonement in the most holy place, um, uh, and uh, I'll just backtrack back to a uh, great controversy, day of uh, day of atonement and uh, uh in the in the book great controversy um i don't know if i'll get the page mm. let me see Maybe if I don't get it, I'll give you this reference letter. I'll try and give you the reference letter, but it was for those only who had appeared uh, before the Lord. It, it was only for those who had appeared uh, before the Lord. But uh, my, my point is this, that uh, the atonement in the most holy place is for those who understood the truth of uh, the most holy place. Uh, the atonement for the holy place is for those who their salvation had reached there in the holy place. 
and uh, Seventh Day Adventists are not to be found in the holy place. They have to go into the holy place, most holy place by faith. And there is the atonement of the tabernacle congregation or the atonement in the courtyard. Uh, and I think this uh, uh, has to do, uh, and uh, maybe I can talk about it in uh, another time, the, the atonement for the heathens and the savages, those who have uh, never heard the gospel at all, Jesus Christ makes the atonement there at the uh, at the altar because they know they, they have never heard the word of God and the word of God is in the holy place. And so those are the heathens. And uh, 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 those people have never professed uh, uh, any Christianity, but uh, uh, we are told in the writings of Sister White that uh, they have entertained missionaries, they have done acts of kindness, they have followed the law of nature, and so they will be in heaven because Christ has made an atonement for them. And also, uh, may I just add in passing, the atonement in the courtyard is for the infants, because no one goes in heaven without atonement. For the infants who will be in heaven, for the children who will die without knowing the law of God, but have lived a life that is worthy. The children who have that uh, tembrane uh, that uh, is required of a Christian, and you can find that in uh, selected messages. You can find that in last day events that there are children who will be in heaven. But all people who are going in heaven, they are going there with an atonement. And that atonement, I believe, for the children, they have not known the word of God. They have not experienced what is the law of God. And so the atonement is covered in the courtyard. Uh, we can also look into that. What does the Lord expect of the wise virgins at this time? What has, does he expect? from, uh, uh, from uh, those who have entered into the most holy place by faith. The book of Malachi, <clears throat> the book of Malachi chapter three, give me five minutes, I'll be done. <clears throat> Malachi chapter three, and uh, <clears throat> I'm looking at, uh, verse three <clears throat> and verse four. Now, when you read Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 applies to 1840s, you can do your own research. I'm just throwing statements at you. But when you look at verse 3 and 4, it applies to the end time generation. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as uh, uh, and as in former years. Also the book of Jeremiah. So we are expected to offer the offering of righteousness, please and the offering of Judah and Jerusalem as it were in the days of old, as in the former years. Then Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50, is it verse 25? Uh, no, Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 15, verses um, 20, no 25. In those days, in that time, said the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none in the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found for I'll pardon them whom I reserve. Now, this whom I reserve is the remnant. It is the sons uh, of Judah and the sons of Israel whose atonement has been made. And so their, uh, uh, their sins shall be sought for and they shall not be found. Why is it that they are not found? Because they are standing on Mount Zion, having the father's name in their forehead. And uh, they are now able to receive the latter rain and be able to sound the loud cry. What have we been talking about? It is about the repetition of the midnight cry of Matthew chapter 25. Now, connected to this Matthew chapter 25, this is the last thing we are reading in uh, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And uh, connected to this parable, it is the parable of the talents.
he says that um, verse 14 for the kingdom of heaven is an, a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods and unto one he gave five talents to another two to another one to every man according to his several ability and straight away took a journey uh, and so you find that um, connected to the parable of the virgins is the parable of the talent and so if the lord has ordained them then he has given the gift to them also to be able to finish up the work and so we are seeing that uh, under the midnight crime under the proclamation of the first angel message the repetition of it the talents shall be given to the people who are going to enter into the vineyard and this is the most challenging thing do you know your talent if you do not know the talent then you are not like the children of Issachar who understood the time and what they ought to do because you cannot do a work which you are not qualified for so you must be qualified for you to be able to do the work and the qualification of that work is in this parable also the talents are given now you will be surprised or not be surprised to know the one who hid the talent is the foolish virgin and then when Christ demanded of him if he were ready if he had anything to offer he had nothing and so when he thought that he could do anything it was too late to do anything it will be so late for some people to know their talents and use them aright because time will be too late for them I'm praying that um, we may be able to realize what it means to repeat the first angel's message what it means to repeat the midnight cry uh, midnight cry message again and what it means to identify our talents under this parable so that we may not to try to do something that the Lord had not ordained us to do but we may only do that which the Lord has ordained us to do and he says that he gives the gifts according to the measure and so look at yourself and what you have been doing you know on the day of atonement we have been told that we should not be doing a survival job which means that the Lord has equipped us with a talent to work for him that will be in uh, in uh, in line with the proclamation of the three angels message in the end time so you ask yourself this job that i'm doing right now is it a talent of god that is proclaiming the third angels message or i'm just doing my survival job and it's not connected to the third angels message will be like that man who received the talent and hid it and went to do his own things and when the master comes he thought that the work could be done by proxy. He thought that by hiding the talent, he will be able to enter, but he did not enter. May the Lord bless us. I know that uh, maybe people are hearing things for a first time, but uh, I pray that the Spirit may bring the understanding to you so that uh, we may be able to revisit these things again. We may have an upper room experience so that the Lord may help us to be like the children of Issachar who understands the time and what they ought to do under the parable of uh, the ten virgins may the lord bless us and shall we close with the word of prayer before maybe we can do anything else abba father we want to thank you because we don't want to live in ignorance at the time of ignorance you winked at it but you command everyone at this time to repent and so we pray that lord you may be able to cleanse us you may be able to awake us whichever situation you can use to awake us lord use it that uh, we may be ready for the events before us. Bless your children, and may this Sabbath be uh, a portion of uh, uh, reconsecration and uh, a time for refreshing from thee, that uh, we may be used by you as vessels of honor in thy sanctuary to do thy holy work. Glory and honor be unto thee, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.